Okay, um, why don't we uh, get started? Thanks everybody for coming. Um, I want to really uh, thank uh, Karen and uh, Sharon for organizing this. This is part of our uh, pop up practice series. My name is uh, Josh Jarstein. If I haven't met you, I'm the Associate Dean for Public Health Practice and Training. Um, I used to be the City Health Officer in Baltimore and the State Health Officer for Maryland. And one of the things that our office does is uh, try to take um, some of the uh, different topics that are being learned here and kind of apply them to real life situations and kind of think through what is it like not just to be doing research on the topic but to actually be um, responsible for it on the public health side. So that's going to be the theme. I want to uh, thank Beth Resnick and Lainey Ruthko from uh, involved in the practice office who helped organize this with Karen. And um, this is going to be pretty interesting because we certainly found the topic to rip from the headlines, as I say today, uh, with Zika. And um, this is going to be a little different than how many people here went to the um, forum last week and heard all the good. So this is not going to be a repeat of that. Okay, that was a really interesting discussion of kind of the cutting edge of research. This is going to be more of a dialogue about what it's like to be responsible. How do we think about this? And we're going to really try to engage you all in thinking about that um, as well. So we'll have plenty of time for questions. I'm going to be kind of moderating, and my goal in moderating is going to be to um, move things along and really try to get a lot of interaction because we have some really interesting um, perspectives that uh, you'll be hearing. So um, the first um, speaker is going to be uh, Dr. Richard Brooks. Dr. Brooks is an, um, uh, an internist who uh, went to medical school at Duke and uh, got a public health degree from UNC, worked in uh, clinical medicine as well as uh, teaching, and now is with the EIS at CDC and eight months ago came to Maryland. Maryland has a, um, a fabulous uh, infectious disease group in public health, really some of the best people that um, I, I've ever worked with. And, you know, we, we will be talking about I know this is the International Health Seminar, so we will be talking about international, but I think it's helpful also to appreciate uh, what's going on right here in Maryland because, frankly, there's some countries internationally that are kind of in a similar situation. Not all of them are Brazil. So, you know, it's sort of a spectrum of different um, experiences. So, um, Dr. Uh, Brooks, we're not, this is not going to be like the half hour per person, and I'm a pretty... Um, aggressive moderator. So <laughs> we'll cut off, you know, the sound system. We'll, we'll, no, I'm kidding. But, but, but I, 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 I know that the people that we picked really are interested in the discussion and kind of thinking through the challenges. This is a very intense, serious challenge. I was in Bogota um, a couple weeks ago, um, and we had some meetings with the uh, health ministry and appreciating the intensity of what is going on there now. I mean, uh, when I was the health um, Secretary of Maryland when uh, the Ebola kind of panic hit in the U.S. while there was a real Ebola crisis. And, you know, to, to be in the center of an actual, uh, you know, evolving public health crisis is really an intense experience. And it doesn't just engage your scientific investigative skills. It engages everything because you're dealing with people who are very panicked. At one point, you know, um, Someone said that the, the visual image was that he dreamt of him being followed around by thousands of pregnant women asking for help. You know, and that, that's kind of the pressure that it feels like uh, in, in that setting. So um, let's start with Dr. Brooks, and we'll move on to our other great speakers. Thank you. How do I advance this? Uh, the, use the forward arrow on the keyboard and pull it out. There's no yeah. Yeah. All right, thanks, Josh. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. I mean, sticking with the theme that local is global and global is local, I think uh, my goal here is to sort of talk to you a little bit more about um, what I've been doing and what my colleagues have been doing at the State Department of Health over the last uh, about a month in response to Zika. I think part of the reason we keep finding ourselves in the situations we are in with Ebola and with Zika is because we keep trying to approach these from a a regional perspective or an area perspective, and until we actually step back and really see this as a global responsibility, this is just going to keep happening. Um, so the call, my first call, came in on January 19th. I got a call from a 31-year-old woman who is 30 weeks pregnant. She had traveled to the island of Martinique from January 8th to January 18th 
reported that she was feeling well, had not had any symptoms, um, but again, keep in mind she'd only been back for one day. Um, and she wanted some more information on being tested for Zika virus. And I had like literally maybe heard about this, you know, a couple days before, didn't really know a whole lot about it, um, but did a little research and told her um, I would get back to her and ended up saying, well, CDC is currently recommending that only people with symptoms be tested, so, you know, we'll uh, be in touch. And we actually went on to go back to her a few weeks later and test when they changed the recommendations. So this is uh, a slide in no particular order. Again, just to give you a little bit of an idea of all of the different things that we at DHMH have had to think about, talk about, create plans for um, over the last month. Um, so just to go through them. So who needs to be tested? Who doesn't need to be tested? Do we follow CDC's guidelines for testing? Do we develop our own guidelines for testing? Are there situations where we want to test outside of their guidelines for some reason? Who actually physically approves each patient for testing? And at that time, testing was only being done at CDC, not anywhere else. Um, so we had to sort of create all the logistical plans around getting those specimens and sending them on to CDC. How do we keep track of all these inquiries that are coming in? How do we keep track of who's actually been approved and who hasn't been approved? Uh, how do we make sure that all the clinicians in Maryland are updated on guidelines and recommendations? How do we make sure that the local health departments, every county in the city of Baltimore in Maryland has a local health department, and so they all need to be informed about this. They all need to be on the same page. They all need to be making the same recommendations, following the same guidelines that we're um, applying. How do we ensure we're keeping up with all of CDC's guidelines and recommendations? They were literally changing on an almost daily basis. How do we make sure that the local health departments are aware of their residents who we've approved for testing because the state is doing the testing, not the local health departments? Uh, what specimens actually need to be collected? Is it plasma? Is it serum? Is it whole blood? What tubes do those go in? Once they're collected, do they get refrigerated? Do they get spun down? Do they get frozen? Where do they go in the lab? Does the lab, does the provider's lab keep them? Does it go to the local health department? Does it come from the local health department to the state health department before it goes to CDC? Who fills out the forms that goes with the specimens? It's a lot of stuff. Um, how do clinicians get the specimens transported? Um, and then the question came up, can we actually do any of the testing at DHMH? So fortunately, pretty quickly, we um, have an amazing, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, but we have an amazing public health lab in the state of Maryland. Um, really awesome people who are really- people know where that is? Yeah, it's literally across the street. Beautiful new building, amazing. The people who work there are fantastic. So that's a um, great resource for us. We're very fortunate to have that. So they are now doing PCR testing and ELISA serology testing for Zika virus. Um, so which patients need testing of convalescent specimens. So everybody's acute now, we think, who are potentially being tested. Who's gonna need to go on and be tested in their convalescent um, stage after they've finished having illness? Um, how do we now communicate all these results we're getting back to the providers who ordered them? How do we get it back to the local health departments and make sure that they're aware? Um, how are Virginia and DC handling cases? What do we do if a DC resident shows up to a provider in Maryland? What do we do when a Maryland resident shows up to a provider in DC? How do we get those specimens back and forth? Do we test DC's specimens and just send them the results, vice versa? Don't know. Um, how do we re release our results to the public? Are we telling them additional details, like which of our positive cases are pregnant, which ones are travel associated, which ones might be sexually transmitted? Are we doing it in conjunction with when CDC releases their state updates, or are we doing it at a different time? Um, and then what's our plan for controlling the mosquito population um, when it starts to, to um, come up in spring? What's the Maryland Department of Agriculture doing? Um, who's handling media inquiries? What are we telling the media? What are we not telling the media? So again, lots of questions, lots of things to think about. So, uh, and then I just also wanted to list and sort of make everybody aware of a lot of the different partners that we've been working with on this, because it's easy to forget that we are not just, you know, an entity into our, unto ourselves. We have a lot of other people that we have to bring into this situation. So um, this is a great opportunity. None of us in infectious disease had really worked all that closely with uh, uh, our colleagues in the Bureau of Maternal and Child Health at the health department, and this is a really unique situation where we have an infectious disease that's potentially impacting pregnant women um, and their um, children. Uh, so we've really come together with them, which has been fun. Uh, the Office of Preparedness and Response, so they're the people who really try to think ahead and plan about the future and try to make sure that we're responding to this uh, across all systems in the state. 
Uh, Maryland Department of Agriculture is largely responsible for the mosquito population vector control. Obviously, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, as I've already mentioned, the local Maryland health departments, Maryland hospitals and clinical providers. Um, so we've sent out clinician letters, I think now three times to over 19,000 clinical providers in the state of Maryland. Um, and then Maryland universities and academic centers like Johns Hopkins. And then finally, I just wanted to list some of the ongoing activities, sort of the latest. This is what we are literally doing like now, today, yesterday, tomorrow. So we have now had over 270 requests for testing since January 19th, which is an average of 10 requests per weekday. So this is literally like every day my email just piles up and there's a whole bunch of us on the email list and everybody says, I'll take this one, I'll take this one, I'll take this one, I'll just take this one and we call them back and we find out and we make approvals and we fill out forms and put them in the database. Um, so just yesterday we had a local health department conference call where we started the process of transitioning some of the authority for approving testing over to the local health department. So again, trying to um, diffuse that responsibility a little bit on the most clear cut cases. Working on developing a plan for vector control uh, with, in partnership with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Uh, developing an, a, a plan now for returning, like I said, all these results to the local health departments, providers, and patients. So for every person that gets tested for Zika virus, they're automatically being tested for dengue and chikungunya as well. Um, so there's a PCR test for each of those. There's an IgM test for each of those. So now for each patient, you have at least six results coming back um, for an acute patient. And then we are now also testing urine um, because there's some data that the PCR test remains positive longer in urine. Um, so that's the seventh test for some pe people. And then for people who have positive ELISAs, those results get sent, those specimens get sent on to CDC for further testing. And then those results come back to us and we have to figure out how to disseminate those results back to people. Um, improving our communications with labs as this huge data load rapidly increases. We send a spreadsheet back and forth with our lab twice a day with newly approved people. They send it back with uh, specimens they've received and results that they've come up with. Um, improving our website uh, for Zika to make sure it's uh, well designed and easier to read for people and easy to find information. Um, and then awaiting further CDC guidance on sexual transmission. People probably have seen the headlines that just came out late yesterday afternoon when the um, CDC released a health advisory notification um, that they are currently investigating together with state health departments like ours, 14 additional cases of possible sexual transmission. Um, so that's the latest and greatest and uh, we're all trying to figure out exactly what to do with that. So hopefully that gives you some idea of kind of what things are going on locally. Uh, thank you, Dr. Brooks. That was terrific. Gives you a very different sense of the problem from maybe the research uh, uh, presentations that were there the other day. It reminded me when we were um, uh, dealing with Ebola, I got a call that uh, from an elected official, did I know that there was an Ebola patient coming to the NIH in Maryland? I said yes. Did I know that they were being flown into a special air base in Frederick? Yes. Did I know that there would be a um, uh, convoy of police cars to take the ambulance to, to NIH just in case there was any problem along the way. Yes, I did know that. What was my plan in case the ambulance broke down en route? <laughs> so there's really, it, it's, it's a different perspective. Now some people may hear those kinds of details and go like, I would rather be developing the vaccine in the lab. I totally respect that. <laughs> but I hear those details and I think this is exciting to be doing something like this right at the front lines. Um, and. Uh, I'm very pleased our next speaker is Dr. Uh, Castillo, professor uh, here, who um, has worked for many years at the Pan American Health Organization and is actually uh, doing a lot of work with health officials in Latin America around Zika. Um, he's going to uh, give a, uh, some comments on what is going through uh, their mind at this point in time. Thank you very much, Dr. Castillo. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's have uh, the next. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, again, I, I will be focusing uh, mainly in the public health surveillance uh, in t two specific countries, Mexico and Colombia. I am uh, very much in contact with uh, the authorities uh, and the field epidemiologists uh, there. Uh, 
One uh, uh, aspect is that I, I will be focusing uh, in the response uh, 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 from those countries. Uh, with uh, Rene Najera, that has been also an epidemiologist from the state of Maryland, we start seeing uh, the tremendous uh, increment in the number of uh, response about the reports in uh, PubMed. Uh, I want to put the context of what is happening with social media and actually the technical reports. Has been uh, for many years, almost decades, with a very uh, uh, normal very few uh, reports and information. And uh, last year and this year has been huge increase. As you could see, the Google Trends uh, information is also uh, very flat for many, many years. And then suddenly, we have a lot uh, of the responses. What is uh, uh, important for us is also to see the searches. And as you know, in our public health surveillance uh, uh, classes, we are monitoring now uh, many of the tweets at social media for different conditions, uh, including Zika. Then we need, uh, we want to understand the behavior of the responses from the population, too. And here is uh, the tweets and the searches. Uh, uh, the concentration of the uh, Google searches has been basically in some uh, countries and cities, particularly in Venezuela. There is a lot of interest about the Zika virus. With that, I will be moving uh, uh, very fast in uh, the way as Mexico is handling uh, this uh, outbreak. First of all, they emphasize that the key monitoring now is dengue. Dengue is the one that is highly affecting the country. And many of the, uh, the interventions that have been implemented for uh, Zika goes to a screening of every patient uh, to uh, check if they, they are dengue cases, chikungunya, and then Zika. They, don't, uh, they go into the algorithms to understand that actually the uh, crisis uh, and the mortality is for dengue. Dengue is a real serious public health problem in Mexico. This uh, also uh, is linked to different event-based surveillance systems that uh, uh, very recently has been Zika also incorporated in the surveillance during the visit of the Pope in Mexico in the different cities. That was important because uh, uh, we start uh, assisting the government in event ways linked to the uh, visit of the Pope. There were 16 conditions that were monitoring, uh, including Zika. And in order to do that, they, they need to have the case definitions, as all of you know that is the, one of the critical components, and to differentiate the chikungunya with uh, uh, dengue and Zika. And actually, uh, when my discussion, uh, discussions yesterday with uh, our Colombian counterparts, they indicated that from the clinical perspective, all share many of the uh, symptoms. However, they could identify the Zika by the uh, petechias, the, the problem with uh, the uh, skin rashes that is extremely intensive. And chikungunya is basically uh, the arthritis and uh, the, the way as people walk. They have 60% inclination. They differentiate very well the clinical uh, suspected cases, both in Colombia and in Mexico. It's important also uh, for the uh, sentinel epidemiologists to recognize in the different cities what is the transmission and what is the incubation period and all the parameters that are relevant for the response. In Mexico, we have uh, 93 confirmed cases of Zika. Most of them are from Chiapas and uh, Oaxaca. Uh, and all of them came from Colombia. Colombia is the seed that enter uh, Mexico. And for uh, the pregnant woman that has been uh, recognized with Zika, there are eight. And yesterday, in my discussion with the uh, director of uh, epidemiology, they already have two of them. They deliver, and there is no uh, problem with the children. There is no microcephalia or any uh, problem with uh, uh, the 
uh, nervous systems. They intensify, and for us, it's uh, perhaps uh, very important to see uh, what is the intensification. This is what is happening also in uh, the city of Barranquilla. Barranquilla is in the uh, coast, the Atlantic coast, and is the center or the epicenter of the cases of Zika. They are closing, uh, 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 working very close with us. The uh, Universidad del Norte is the partner with uh, Hopkins in providing uh, public health surveillance there. These are uh, the main uh, responses that uh, the uh, country in Mexico, they change the intensification of uh, the different surveillance systems. They understood uh, uh, that Mexico is one of the few countries that have all the surveillance system active, including the entomological and the virologic surveillance. And because of that, they need to uh, provide a lot of the responses from many other countries in Latin America. They intensify the basic epidemiological surveillance in all the critical states. They intensify also the entomological uh, surveillance. They focalize, particularly in Chiapas, Oaxaca, Veracruz, the areas that uh, they have uh, most of, of the cases. The INDRE, that is a, a high-end uh, laboratory, they are uh, even sequencing the, uh, the genes of the Zika virus. They are already in the banks at the uh, international level. Uh, they recognize that is the uh, Asian uh, species and they are the ones that do most of the monitoring of the virology. Perinatal surveillance and the neurological surveillance has been uh, developed with a lot of intensification in specific areas, not in all the areas, but the areas that are critical. Uh, they were very concerned that the population is not really uh, very aware of the different protection that need to be done uh, with the vector. They concentrate most of the interventions against the vector, uh, at the, the recommendation of the Pan-American Health Organization, and the education of the population. But the population uh, education is not easier. They have been uh, dealing with uh, uh, dengue for many, many years. And as you know, the lack of uh, water, potable water, uh, make that most of these uh, uh, population groups, they uh, uh, put uh, uh, water in containers that uh, become breeding size uh, for uh, even inside the houses. The importance is the, uh, the response by Mexico authority is that they need to convince the, the families and the population that because the transmission is inside the houses and the breeding sites are inside, they need uh, to collaborate in covering the containers and to try to uh, uh, protect themselves by uh, different of the uh, repellents and uh, the uh, screens in, in the houses. Uh, I also had been uh, in discussion with uh, the Brazilian authorities and they are very concerned about pregnant women. Pregnant women are very confused by the media. They, uh, every single day there is a, 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 the intensification of the alerts and uh, all, almost the panic and they uh, try to coordinate a new public uh, a opinion campaign to uh, try to calm down uh, most of the pregnant women. They incorporate, as in Mexico and Colombia, the Office of Gender and Equality. Those are uh, now uh, being part of the focalized surveillance of maternal and uh, perinatal uh, 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 health. Uh, in general, uh, we know that uh, because there is no treatment, most of the interventions should be against the vector and about uh, the protection of uh, individuals. The, uh, regarding the pregnant uh, women that are uh, diagnosed with Zika, uh, Mexico uh, uh, was very concerned if uh, there is uh, the possibility of microcephalia, but they could not find any so far. 
Uh, in Colombia, they are expecting, uh, as uh, Dr. Espinal was mentioning last week, maybe uh, they are waiting for June, July to see if the ones that were infected in the uh, first trimester will be the ones that have been showing uh, the same uh, problems like in Brazil. Brazil uh, uh, is uh, intensifying also some of the surveillance uh, systems for the Olympics. And Mexico decided to uh, uh, assign two epidemiologists, uh, the field epidemiologists, for the delegation of Mexico that will be uh, in the, the Olympics. We will be developing a real-time surveillance system for them and uh, uh, we are moving into most of the countries to incorporate real-time surveillance systems to monitor what is happening uh, with uh, these e events uh, and, and problems. With that, I will uh, finalize my brief presentation for most of your questions. But I want to uh, mention that for us in public health, it's important to understand when the World Health Organization under the International Health Regulations of 2005 declare a public health emergency of international concern, what is the meaning? And, and uh, so far has been only four uh, of these uh, uh, declarations uh, that uh, mobilize uh, all the world to address the problem. I hope all of you know which uh, has been these four uh, a, a declarations because it's vital for us in public health to understand uh, when the international health regulations is, are being uh, requested, uh, what happened with all the countries. And uh, there is a very interesting, uh, uh, not only the declaration, but also the opportunities for us in public health to uh, collaborate with uh, these very important efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you uh, very much, um, Dr. Castillo. So um, our, our next uh, speaker is Ellie Leoncini. Uh, she is uh, a physician and a, a faculty member in international health. And uh, we thought that her expertise fit very nicely into this because as you go from the research side into actually implementing effective programs, you have to be able to think through all the various steps of what it's like to take an idea into the field. And this is uh, an area of her expertise that she'll be talking about with particular application to Zika. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for coming. I see my students there, so I'm very pleased. And one second, bear with me. All right. All right, so um, today um, I chose to take the angle of uh, entomologic surveillance, the need for the entomologic surveillance and the tailoring of the community response according to entomologic surveillance. So I wanted to start with some uh, facts about the ve vector biology of Aedes aegypti or Aedes alpopictus. They're similar. Um, so they are, um, this, this mosquito is silent, very discreet, is a day biter, and has overwhelming preference for humans, for human blood. Takes multiple blood meals, um, and so this is different from Anopheles, from the malaria vector that takes one nice sip and then rests on the wall. This one goes around and picks, and takes three or four different blood meals for one liter of eggs. And so that means it's a highly efficient vector because it can transmit in very low densities. You don't need a lot of Aedes to get an epidemic going, an outbreak. Um, then where it likes to hide is in closets, under beds, under tables, where people aren't where human smell is. Uh, clothes that are worn once and put back in the closet are perfect. Um, so it can be present all over and without people realizing it. So here um, I want to briefly go through the life cycle just because 
the entomologic surveillance uh, focuses so much on the life cycle. So we have the egg that when it uh, gets inside water, it hatches into a larva. Then the larva becomes pupa for just a day or two. And then from the pupa, we have the adult mosquito emerging. These are, um, the, this is the shape of uh, mosquito. Um, it is Egyptian mosquito eggs. I think you should take a good look because they are visible by naked eye. So you can see them. It's not dirt what you see, it's actual eggs. Um, in this slide, I liked it because it has a nice picture of the pupa and the larvae in a fishbowl. And this is a nice one from the CDC where the pupa that was, that was once down here, now from that pupa emerges the adult. So I'd like to, this is the, my most important slide for the day, I think. And if you understand this, I think you'll understand vector control for the rest of your careers. And you are not going to be confused. Um, so this mosquito, it is mosquito, likes to lay eggs on walls of containers that contain water. Not inside the water directly, but on the walls, right above the water surface. This is very different from Anopheles here, that likes to, uh, to lay the, these eggs, single eggs, but on top of the water surface. They're floating. And Culex, this is the um, pest mosquito, the one that buzzes and bites at night, uh, well, at dusk. Um, and we're most uh, inconvenienced by this one makes rafts. These are all stuck eggs, and the raft floats in the water. So what does this tells us, tell us now for uh, control purposes? If you have standing water that has no walls, you may find a ton of mosquitoes there, but you won't find the Aedes mosquito. So when we say eliminate stagnant water, what do we mean? It has to have walls. Um, so this is, the, this is um, from my colleague in the DR. Uh, for some work we were doing. So she's ex inspecting for uh, eggs here along the water surface of this water storage tank. And here, this is a nice way, I think, to show the eggs. That's how they get deposited in containers with walls. All around where once the water was, the water probably was just here in that level. And so they went and oviposited all around that container. This is where, what you have to look for. And so these, these, this is just a picture of um, uh, habitats of other mosquitoes that could be producing tons, but not the Aedes mosquito, because they don't have walls. Also, Culex likes very dirty water, uh, fecally contaminated. And Aedes likes these um, open, jungle-like um, puddles. So, Again, great mosquito producers, but not EDs. So um, I want to make a plea today for uh, the need for entomologic surveillance, just like uh, we have a huge need for um, epidemiologic surveillance. And we need EIS officers, as entomologic surveillance officers, that are trained to be the same detectives, just in the same high quality as the EIS officers. Um, and so I think in the absence of that kind of uh, expert, we tend to readily transfer information that we have about one mosquito towards another mosquito and think that all mosquitoes are the same. Both, I think, public health people can do that <laughs> as well as lay people. Um, and so it's important to do good, careful entom entomologic surveillance in the area that we're con concerned about. And uh, implement recommendations exactly, specifically tailored to that, to those, um, to, to, the, or to our data. And ignore any other recommendations that come from the media, from experts, from whatever. You need to know your surveillance in your area. So a frequent assumption is that these mosquitoes breed in the garbage, in containers in the garbage, and that's not untrue. However, in the majority of circumstances, when we do apply entomologic, uh, entomologic surveillance, we see otherwise, and Dr. Castillo already mentioned, the water storage problem. In most of the world, we have a big 
a water scarcity problem that generates the need to store water. And of course, people live with a vector inside their homes where they store their own water. This is a picture from the DR. This is the famous tanque, tanque de agua, where um, and inside, a lot of times, you even see a cement lining that makes it even heavier to tilt, and there is no uh, drainage. And you can really get rid of larvae in this kind of situation. This is the famous pila, um, very common in Latin America, uh, where we wash clothes and dishes. This is the part where you wash the clothes and dishes and you take water from here into here. So this is a nice, great um, habitat for edis. Um, this is from Brazil. Um, in this specific situation, the cover of this water, water tank is on top, so that's safe, as it is like this is safe, but when a hurricane comes and takes it off, then it's not safe. This is a, the very common water storage container in Southeast Asia, the clay pot, and it's mostly uncovered, and you use a smaller container either to drink or to shower with. Um, this is the traditional bathtub who, who has traveled in Thailand, Singapore, I mean, uh, Indonesia, Cambodia? The, uh, have you seen, have you, can you identify with this? In, this is from a travel guide. This is the traditional bathroom. So this bathtub here is a water storage tank, really. You don't get in it to bathe. You, you use this container to scoop up water to flush the toilet or to take a shower. This has a drainage. It's very diff Sometimes it has, sometimes it doesn't. It's very difficult, first of all, to see. It's very dark in there. It's very difficult to see. Um, the mosquitoes usually are all along this line, the mosquito eggs. Um, it's full of larvae most of the time. It's very hard to clean. Um, you use the water all the time. It's, you don't drink that water, so why bother? So it's a perfect. Uh, habitat inside your home, and you're worrying about outside, but you have it inside. So in this, this smaller tank is to flush the toilet. This is to take a shower with. Again, you don't get in. See how they're black? Because it's very hard to clean. Same here, it's very hard to clean. So this is a one type of container we have to be worried about. The second one is the tires. The tires is the, a great way to transport eggs. They provide a heaven for edis because it's dark in here. There's water. If they are rained on, there's water. Then you, there's no way to take, it out of, take the water out of that tire if it's full of, of rainwater. No matter how you tilt the tire and you roll the tire, the water stays in. So it's perfect for oviposition in, in here. So then with the trade of used tires, they spread the vector from a country to country. I think that's how Maryland got infected. Um, this is from Maryland. Um, it's cleaned up. It's not a current. Um, it's not a current dump. So when, they're, when the tires are exposed, rainwater, of course, gets in and they become a perfect, this we're going to call this a factory. Because they, millions of adults that are produced from this site then can go to homes, and you, can't keep, you, you want to keep controlling the homes, fine, but if you don't control this, you're going to be getting uh, more and more uh, infestation. So other important sources to check and be worried about is la chatara, very famous, perfect word. Your mouth is a mouthful, la chatara. So, so this is the scrap metal, the graveyards. These, the, those, these provide great surfaces for uh, oviposition. Um, this is during the winter with snow, but then when the water will melt and get filled up, then it's going to be perfect. You want to ask? Does yeah. Matter what the surface is made of, what material it is? Maybe any metal. Surface that's got yeah, any sort of plastic, metal, tie, rubber. Um, yeah. And another surface that's great is the flower pots in cemeteries. Um, people like to bring the, the, the flowers, but then they leave them there. So then that's another factory that keeps seeding 
onto their individual households. And you can control the households, but then the big site is there undisturbed. This is from my colleague in Colombia um, who sent me this slide. And this is a new development. And they, have, they were supposed to put, put roofs in these new homes, but they never did. So this is a full criadero, <laughs> a great criadero. And it's undisturbed. Gutters are a common thing. In Maryland, I think we should look for gutters. When they're clogged up, then there's standing water, and walls are there, and it's perfect for breeding. And then, of course, the smaller containers that we're all worried about. And these are when they are littered all over, and there is no waste collection services. They accumulate rainwater, and then they become um, habitats. And this particular one, one of them, because they're small, they're not going to produce that many, because there are many, many of them. Collectively, they, they may be an important site. And then plants, people love plants. They like to water their plants so much. And so they, they are great, again, for um, mosquitoes because the plants have sugars. And this is the bromelia. Um, and inside here, there's rainwater or watering accumulating here. And so it's perfect, again. Each one won't produce much, but if you have many in your yard. So then it follows, after all this, that we have to tailor to, our, um, to those specific habitats that we, that we find. And so some, uh, well, turn, overturning and keeping upside down containers, uh, covering. Um, there's issues with covering, but I leave it as, at that for now. I think it, uh, half covering is worse than non-covering at all. We can get back to it. Um, we have been involved in my um, team with a method of applying household bleach on walls of containers right above the water surface um, to dissolve the eggs. So we're using, we're using um, bleach as, a, as an OV side um, with Good results in, uh, we've used that in Honduras, El Salvador, the Dominican Republic. This is a, a sticker on how to use bleach. You put it on a sponge and then you dab it, untar, you dab it onto the walls. You leave it for 15 minutes and then you, the walls, the eggs are dissolved by then and so you can go ahead and reuse your container. Tires are very, very hard to deal with tires. The correct way is to have them under a roof so they are dry. If they're not under a roof, there are some other things you can cover, you can put lime, and so on. So I'll stop here. Uh, I had this in case it came up, but I won't. Let me go back. Great. Thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. Wow, who learned something from that presentation? That was, that was great. I learned, among other things, that when the mosquitoes are calling, they may be calling from inside the house. That's a little, uh, a little scary. So um, we have plenty of time for uh, discussion. And I want to start by encouraging questions, just clarifying questions on the presentations. And then we'll go to maybe some more in-depth uh, issues. I'll ask one, but then I want, uh, I'll turn to, to the audience maybe for um, Elliot would help, help me understand, um, because it was kind of a bleak picture, all the places that that, 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 that can happen. Um, you know, what is it? that makes a successful public health campaign, and can it really have an impact? I mean, or is it that you do everything you can on the flower pots, but it's something else that's actually, they all just move over there. I mean, what, what, is there something about either the mosquito or examples where you can actually take your knowledge and apply it to make a difference? Sure, Josh. So um, I think a first public health measure is to control those factories, the big areas where we have dumps cemeteries, um, so we stop that, that seeding of the smaller containers. And then the rest is work inside the household. For that, we need good communicators uh, with good relationships that can form rapport, relationships, and can go and show and tell. And that's what 
my work has been on all these years, developing good counselors. Just well, like for HIV, we have counseling and testing. We need counseling and testing for uh, the household. Well, can you give an example of a place where that's been particularly successful? Oh, yeah. Um, in Honduras, we've worked for many years. In Colombia, uh, colleagues of Dr. Uh, Castillo's are working the same. Every vector in Puerto Rico, in El Salvador, um, right now, Brazil is m mobilizing the army. The army is supposed to go door to door to do all this, to do the talking. Hmm. Okay. I mean, it's a new skill, why not? <laughs> we'll, we'll take anyone, but um, that's where we need to put the efforts in good relationships. And I think that's good, not just for Zika, Chikungunya, Dengue, whichever you want to take. Um, it's also good for the rat problem, for the waste, uh, the, the garbage that's littering our back alleys, like we need to communicate with the household. Great. Um, clarifying questions people may have. And uh, go ahead. And maybe just in introduce yourself. My idea is about water sanitation. Um, because it seems like if we didn't have those standing containers, we wouldn't have that problem. Um, and I know there must be, there are a huge number of barriers to that in multiple continents across the world. You know, millions of people have this problem, but I think it's an underlying problem. Uh, I know there are a lot of people working on water and sanitation uh, and technology and distribution, and I, I guess I really don't understand what the main barriers are. Okay, Dr. Casillo. I think it, this is very important for us in, in, uh, in public health because um, you address one of the uh, causes of the causes. Social determinants of health has been uh, uh, now a very important consideration for any of the responses that uh, are more complicated. Uh, water and sanitation is been affecting infant mortality, but also a lot of conditions that are uh, uh, dealing with uh, uh, access to water. Like uh, all of these conditions, chikungunya, uh, Zika, and uh, uh, dengue are being affected by that. Then uh, many of the future interventions should be focusing uh, first in solving that. But also we need to understand that our metrics have not been addressing that. How, what is the percentage of uh, or the attributable population group that can be ascertained by uh, uh, water and sanitation and Zika? That's a very important uh, question that we need to address. The other consideration that was one in successful stories is, is Honduras. Tegucigalpa has uh, uh, its main cemetery in downtown and was very important to have the intervention uh, of the breeding sites uh, in that cemetery. But it's difficult to sustain if there is no solution of the underlying causes like water and sanitation. Uh, and it's something that we need to address uh, because there are many other problems, not only these uh, three problems, but also okay. even infant mortality. So you have uh, the economic challenges, but you also have cultural challenges if you're doing something different with cemeteries, for sure. Um, sure, question. Yeah. If you could just wait for the uh, mic. Go ahead. I wanted to know how far from the place where they are, where the mosquitoes breed, how far away do they fly? Okay, <laughs> uh -huh. as a social entomologist, is there any entomologist in no, the room? Uh, so actually, so the <laughs> do you want to answer? Did you know? So the Aedes mosquitoes uh, travel, travel, yeah, travel very short distances, so uh, less than 100 meters from their breeding site. Um, okay, so, oh. Yeah. Also, I mean, oh, yeah, I some entomological studies have shown that mosquitoes, under some circumstances, go much farther than we might expect. And anophelines, especially, are known to go miles. And yeah, I think that yeah. might not be the case uh, yeah. but if there's other... The I guess my answer the, 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 has to be with how much vector there's around and so much, how much pressure for blood. 
Um, if you have, if you have the family right there where you are created and were born, and you have so many to buy, you don't have to go far. Yeah, I, I think this is very important. Regarding the Anopheles fly, it's also a matter of the wind. If that is a speeding uh, even uh, 500 meters. But uh, what it said is important. The, uh, most of these uh, problems are urban. And uh, the environment in the urban, they don't need to travel uh, very far. With Anopheles and malaria is a different. Uh, uh, but uh, in uh, uh, Zika and uh, Dengue, everything is so close. Then they don't need to go further. It partly depends on whether they have passports. Maybe. Um, OK, yeah. Yeah, um, on that topic, I just wanted to add that sometimes it's not just the mosquito, how, how far they fly, but it's how far the humans actually walk when they're sick. Because they could be um, bringing the virus to another place where there are mosquitoes. So right. yeah, that's the but other I, let, Let's take that, this theoretical discussion a little bit to the practice level here, which would be if we think that generally speaking, they don't go very far, not to say that there may not be one that gets on the wind or something like that. To me, that would, that would strike me as a pretty important public health message and very motivating for people to take care of their homes. If you think that there's going to be a breeding ground a mile away, that there's nothing you can do at home, it may be less, um, you know, less impactful. I, is that part of the messaging that goes on in these well, areas? Well, there are two messages. Uh, I think that is one. But the other is that because of the continuous traveling, any in infected person that goes from one country to another will be the seat for the new transmission. That, that's what happened with, uh, in Mexico. Most of the people that were in Colombia, they came to Mexico, and that started the, uh, the problem. We need to understand the dynamics uh, that is an urban problem, but also that many of the travelers that could be infected then could go to other places and start the new cycle. Yeah. Good. And uh, either uh, Dr. Brooks or Dr. Leon, um, it, what are the messages that get people to take action on mosquitoes? I mean, it, you know, if it's not that you, it will affect your family's risk, how do you, tr you know, what are the successful campaigns? What are the messages of those campaigns? Well, how do you motivate people to, to take action in that area? Yeah, so um, first, some knowledge, some key knowledge is, is uh, useful. For example, in communities where people haven't been focusing on eggs, by providing them with that knowledge is a ha-ha moment for them. Oh, I didn't know. I've seen these for so long. I thought they were just dirt. Oh, I didn't know there were mosquitoes. Well, let me do something about it. That is a motivator, is a key knowledge. However, if in the, in the long run, if the methods that we propose, the methods that we propose have to be feasible, acceptable, easy to do, in, uh, incorporated in a habit, in a routine. Um, so no matter how much they know, if they have to store their water, they can't do much. Um, with their smaller containers, they can do something. Um, so we've tried to find methods that are part of their routine, but then use them in a more interesting, more innovative way. For example, the one that I, that I showed with the chlorine bleach is a household uh, material that is commonly found in Latin America. That's not necessarily the case all over. But in Latin America, there is a love of bleach. You know that because you've had your clothes washed there, and you know how they came back. So um, people love to use bleach. And we have people that are addictive. In fact, they just dump bleach. So you can moderate that. You can say you don't have to put that much. But um, it's something feasible and acceptable that we've found in the settings that I've worked. But I don't like to generalize without That's a very, very, research. Very good point. So. Dr. Brooks, did you? Well, I was just going to say, this, uh, these questions have definitely fed into sort of our discussions about our plans for vector control. Again, acknowledging that that's more Maryland Department of Agriculture than our uh, wheelhouse. But um, we've talked a lot about um, spraying responses, which I think is sort of the first thing that people here in the United States 
think about when they're talking about trying to control mosquitoes. Um, and so this is fed into the conversations around, well, do you just sort of spray in a general area once we know that the mosquitoes are out? Do you really target your spraying more to areas around the home where you know there's actually been a case of Zika? Do you try to do surveillance and identify mosquito pools that are infected with the virus, which is what we do for West Nile virus, but actually functions for a lot of different reasons um, differently than uh, how it works for Zika virus. So those are all things that are literally actively being discussed right now by MDA, by our uh, experts at the health department that work on this stuff. So we're still trying to figure all this out and trying to determine what the proper response is. Well, I'm sure it's going to be a very important interaction because MDA is not used to quite thinking yeah. through the, uh, the epidemiology of mosquitoes. Yeah. Um, going back to the topic that you just, uh, sorry, my name is Ricardo Milan. Uh, talking to the topic that you, you, you were saying about control measures, uh, has anybody thought about the Vision uh, Zero Initiative? I know um, it's basically saying that we will never drive uh, like mosquito breeding places to, uh, to, to zero. So there will always be these containers, there will always be litter, and uh, we can reduce it, but it will never disappear. Human behavior is one of the hardest things to change, and though I do believe in, in, in educating the public, has anybody, uh, las pilas and uh, the, los contenedores, they're not gonna disappear. Has anybody thought about making them, uh, making uh, them and giving it to the public, like a cheap container that is just easy, an easy way to put on top, if we can create uh, something to cover up the pilas. So that wouldn't be changing them, it would just giving something that's already included into, uh, into their lives. And when these mistakes happen, we just reduce uh, the probability of mosquitoes. When water accumulates on top of houses because it didn't put a roof, that will keep on happening in Bogota, in Cali, in Barranquilla, with low, uh, with low populations, we create a type of brick that can easily drain out or something. This is just me not knowing anything about architecture or engineering. <laughs> but just simple things that when these mistakes happen, they won't uh, help with mosquito populations. Is there any uh, talks yeah, about that? Sure, so sort of the so general nice. topic of harm reduction for mosquitoes, yeah. So it's me again? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> all right, so um, first I'd like to remind us all that eradication has happened. Um, Fred Soper, a graduate of our school, did it. Um, the threat, the immediate threat at the time was the yellow fever was yellow fever rather than dengue or chikungunya or Zika. Um, and the way it was done is by doing the hard work, uh, eliminating these big sites that I mentioned, and then going door to door and eliminating, um, eliminating or controlling, depending, um, inside the homes. Um, Cuba, Singapore are models right now for not having the infestation. Their islands, you can say, maybe it's easier for them to do it. Uh, they also have very strong, st strict rules and a lot of, do of this hard work. Um, now, definitely, I think if we don't want to, uh, right away, of course, there's no way we can discuss about eradication, especially right now when there is an emergency. So, yes, definitely. Um, I also work in water and sanitation, and in that, under that hat, um, our work has been to, f to find containers, like the hand washing stations that we promote have to be well covered, hermetically covered, so they don't allow mosquito entry. Um, the, tr the drinking water has to be in narrow mouth containers that are also covered. So we're trying to limit um, the opportunities for Aedes mosquito to get into uh, these, these types of containers. For the pilas, um, depends on the pilas. Some are just for longer term storage, so you could cover those. And um, so, PAHO, not PAHO, WHO has tried um, actually insecticide impregnated uh, covers uh, for that type. If it's a um, um, a frequently used one, then covering is not feasible. But it's feasible for the, for the barrels that I showed. Um, what else? Uh, there is other, yeah. there's another, <laughs> I think that's uh, what, other we, what other things we can do. Um, um, and then we have, of course, in, um, in those bigger cisterns, we have fish, 
copy pods um, and um, turtles have been used. Uh, larvivorous fish, larvivorous copy pods and, and turtles. There are issues, again, with each one, but according to the situations, these are feasible right. and to implement. Thank you. Um, other questions, we are not entirely required to focus on mosquitoes. <laughs> so mosquitoes are obviously very important prevention because we don't have a treatment right now, but there are many other public health practice questions that have come up. So I'm hoping people start thinking of non-mosquito questions. Go ahead. Oh, so I have a non-mosquito question. Okay, um, so I was wondering how climate change fits into this because of water scarcity being such a driver of this new um, virus problem that we have, and I'm sure lots of other health problems as well. And so I feel like addressing the containers, especially in um, developing nations, is a really huge task, but maybe in more developed nations addressing climate change, since we don't tend to have those open storage containers in our homes that drive that. Um, I'm just wondering your thoughts on that. I mean, so th that was secretly a mosquito question, whether you knew it or not. So yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't know that any of us actually know, you know ex specifically how climate change is necessarily driving Zika in particular, but I mean, you can th think of a lot of ways that it is. I mean, just as one example, so the range of Aedes aegypti, which is the most efficient transmit uh, vector for this current outbreak, the range for that only extends up to the southern United States, but as the areas become warmer, um, that mosquito may be able to uh, move further up into the United States into areas including, you know, the Maryland area, uh, where right now Albopictus is the primary um, mosquito that's in the 80s family that's around here and is thought to be a less efficient vector. So that's just one way that climate change may affect Zika in particular. Great. Question back there. Hi. Um, sorry. My question's for Dr. Brooks and Dr. Castillo. Dr. Brooks, I was hoping you could maybe tell us a little bit about, um, well, you seem to have a lot of questions. So my question is, how do you find the answers to those questions and make decision? What's the process for decision making? So for instance, in emergency management, there are systems, the incident command system, ICS, where um, they have a very set way of communicating at a certain time of day and different people have different positions when there's not an emergency and then when there's an emergency they put on a different hat. So in, in, the, the, in Maryland, is, is that something that you guys do and, and how do those decisions get communicated? And then my follow-up question for Dr. Castillo is how do you make sure the surveillance data that you're collecting gets to the right people at the right time? Great question. Yeah, those are good questions. So um, I would say, so the Office of Preparedness and Readiness is the office that uh, sort of more directly deals with the kind of incident command structure on a regular basis that you're talking about, though certainly in the situation of having an emergency, we would fit into that structure, us in the Infectious Disease Bureau. Um, and so would, would partake of that and use that communication mean, uh, method. And currently CDC has their emergency operations center stood up for Zika and so are using an incident command structure for their communications. I would say just in the day-to-day -day handling of Zika-related issues um, in my bureau at the health department, it's sort of an ad hoc uh, a way of, of approaching it. So we look to you know prior responses and things we've learned from prior uh, experience to inform how we find the answers to our questions and communicate them out. There are uh, pre um, defined ways of communicating, particularly with the local health departments and particularly with clinicians in the state. So I mentioned that we had sent out uh, at least two or three times already a uh, letter to every clinician in the state. So uh, those letters are drafted by us uh, in, the, in the department and then through our Office for Preparedness and Readiness they maintain a database of provider email addresses that gets sort of blasted out via email to all the providers. And you can limit it to you know certain specialties um, and things like that. Uh, and then in terms of communicating with the local health departments, uh, there's a functionality called a health officer memo. And so again, you put whatever it is that you want to communicate into a, into a letter, and then that gets sent out to each of the different individual health uh, departments. And when it comes in the form of a health officer memo, it tends to come with uh, you know, a, a certain gravity. And so people pay attention to it, and they know it's something important and something they need to pay attention to. It's always a little bit of a fine balance of you know, what do we actually send out by clinician letter? What do we send out by HO memo? 
it, there's also you know uh, message saturation, and if you send things too often and too frequently, people tend to start ignoring them, especially when it comes to the clinician letters. Um, but we do a lot of things in groups. Uh, that's one of the things I really love about DHMH is that uh, it's very inclusive. Uh, we often um, meet all together as a group and talk about things, make decisions, try to find out information together. Even like drafting these HO memos and clinician letters, we often do it as a group, which can be painful at times. But um, yeah. make sure everybody's it's on the same page. It's a third floor activity. I would go down to the third floor. I think it's a, a great question. For, as a secretary, you're kind of seeing how crazy a particular issue is at a particular moment. And when it sort of passes the threshold, I'd activate ICS and say, we're going to do this by incident command so that you know, we can protect the people on the third floor who need to actually figure out what to do. And in the meantime, we'll have somebody dealing with the press. We'll have somebody who's dealing, you know. And so uh, it's a way to get organized if you need to on a particular issue, even if it's just for a few hours in the height of just complete craziness. But generally, you know, it's, it, you know, the, the, we let the chaos happen on the third floor, and then we get the, the results from, from that process, because that's usually very good. Dr. Castillo, do you want to answer? Yeah, very interesting uh, and relevant question. Uh, public health surveillance has been evolving uh, very much since 2005. Uh, before 2005 uh, was almost historical data. Now we are moving into real-time surveillance, and that's a big change. Real-time surveillance uh, required uh, to understand early warning systems, and early warning systems require signals, not only diagnosis. And because of that, uh, we are now moving even in, in the school to understand social media. Uh, social media has been very effective in sending messages in uh, real time. But also, our syndromic uh, surveillance systems uh, are being very uh, now uh, are being modified by the capacity to create these uh, alert uh, thresholds how to move into the proper authorities and the community is something that we need to move uh, faster. The community is, is responding very well. And actually, we have now what we call community-based surveillance systems that are feeding. Uh, many of you are flu near you, uh, feeding the system. And it's very consistent with what is happening with CDC. Uh, we are ma much interested now that the civil society and the community be fully informed. Because that's an area that uh, in the past we didn't pay uh, uh, full attention. It's not only the authorities that obviously had the obligation to have the response, but also how we involve the civil society and the community in actually the response. Response uh, uh, is not simple because many times the people that do the surveillance are not the effectors of the response then they need to go uh, uh, work, as was uh, said, in teams. And team work in different institutions sometimes is complicated. You need uh, uh, even a presidential order for coordination different institutions. But uh, I think we need to remember that uh, surveillance is for action. Then anything that is not going into action should not be uh, monitoring uh, and surveillance. And we have now change totally our vision of how to deal with uh, public health surveillance. So I'm going to follow up on that, uh, that part of the answer, which was great, and say, how many people agree that the public health surveillance shouldn't just be for the public health authorities, that people generally need to know that? So I want to go to, into how hard that can be to implement. I think I would agree with that principle. So um, Dr. Brooks is here from Maryland, um, and there are cases that are getting reported of Zika in Maryland. Um, do you think that uh, the health department should be telling the public the number of cases on Zika? How many people think that? Raise your hand. Um, every, is, would it be okay to do that uh, once a week? Or do you think that it should be, if you think it should be more frequently than once a week? Raise your hand. So it doesn't have to be a running ticker of cases. It could be at a reasonable level. Um, should it just be the number, or would people think it's reasonable to, for the state or necessary for the state to say what the geographic distribution is? How many people think um, geographic distribution? You want to know whether it's in your um, more um, specific than county, like city, or you think county is good enough? I mean, you know, the, the health department knows the house, right? How many people think that the house of every Zika case should be? Yeah. 
<laughs> and I, I, I was in uh, Costa Rica when uh, cholera came to Costa Rica in 1992, and they put the house of the first case and all the drainage on the front page of the paper. That's how I learned some swear words, because the husband of the first patient was on TV uh, swearing about the decision of the gov government to release that. So, um, so not the house. How many people would say the city? OK, now I'm going to go to some harder. So maybe, maybe less than, you know, uh, some cities are kind of small in Maryland. Um, these are all questions that come up. You've got to make a policy. And frankly, one of the best things the public health department can do is say, here's our policy. If you hate it, hate the policy. Don't argue it every single time. When we were dealing with Ebola, we said we wouldn't confirm that there was an Ebola suspect case until it was actually Ebola, because we were sick of getting all the calls. And we had an article written about our press policy. But at least it was about that. Some people agreed and disagreed. Uh, how many people think that uh, the health department should disclose whether a pregnant woman has Zika? Yeah, raise your, raise your hand, yes? And you, you're the reporter. The reporter says, uh, this pregnant woman, it, or you said there were 50 cases in Maryland. Are any of them pregnant women? Raise your hand, yes. Raise your hand, no. Okay, how about Dr. Brooks' thoughts on that? You don't have to, yeah. I don't know if you have a policy or if there's anything Well, going yeah, on. we do. So we are not disclosing whether people are pregnant, and here's why. So at the very beginning of this, um, we contacted, we were in contact with one of the um, early people being tested, and um, she was pregnant, but she hadn't told a lot of people she was pregnant, but a lot of people knew she was being tested for Zika. And so if we publicly released that you know she that we had one case of zika in the t in the state and it was a pregnant woman and some of the people she had told she was being tested for zika then found out she was positive they would then know she was pregnant so you would automatically in that situation be releasing to people that she didn't want to know that she was pregnant and she may make decisions around that pregnancy because she's been infected with zika virus to perhaps terminate the pregnancy and then you've then now she, you've told people that she's terminating her pregnancy without her giving Or people could start to... asking her a right. lot of questions. Right, they put two and two together. Okay, anybody change their mind as a result of that explanation? <laughs> um, so, you know, I'll tell you, the, the test that I applied in that situation is, is it important for public health for people to know? I'd, and, you know, I'll give you, an, if we had a, a meningococcus case, we would name the teacher, the kindergarten class, where she was, you know, that actually happened because her students need to get rifampin, right? On the other hand, if it's something where it's just sort of everybody just wants to know, why don't you tell us is there, who is the suspect case of Ebola in the University of Maryland Medical, you know, we're, we're not gonna be, be doing that. There's absolutely no public health benefit. So and a public health official has to kind of balance these things and you're probably not gonna make everybody happy on that. Uh, okay. I have a comment uh, about yeah. that. Uh, uh, we need to recognize that the, the best uh, detectives for surveillance are the media people, TV and uh, reporters. 60% of all the outbreaks have been detected by them before us in public health. And this is very important why the common centers and the situation rooms are monitoring the news. Because uh, you could not believe how insisting uh, I didn't rely, uh, I didn't give a lot of the information for the reporters when I was at PAHO, but they went to my staff and they got the information. And that's very important for us to understand that even the WHO and the countries have the most comprehensive uh, surveillance system is in Canada monitoring the media. It's very important for us. And there's even some monitoring Twitter for outbreaks, yeah. Oh, okay. Oh. Uh, I'd like to add that um, for me as a social scientist, and I see a few social scientists in the room, if you'd like to help me out, I th I'd like to uh, uh, link such announcements with behaviors. Not just say there is a Zika case, but so what does this mean for me that I'm hearing this news? What should I do? And tell what we should do. If there's no action that follows, then we were just creating a panic. 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 Yeah. Great, Renee. Hello, uh, Renee. I'm a PRPH student here at the school. Um, so, in the four declarations of public health emergencies of international concern, they didn't happen just like that. They took a while to build up to uh, being an emergency, and a lot of people saw them coming. So, for example, in 2009. We were seeing that Mexico's flu season didn't end. 
and we were talking to CDC flu people, and they were like, well, it's probably an abnormal flu season, but nobody really went and tested for the, for the virus. And then people come over the border, we find that it's H1N1, all of a sudden we have an emergency and we have a pandemic. With Zika, there was a huge outbreak of Zika in, in the Gabon in 2007, there was uh, French Polynesia, and if you look at some of those PubMed articles, there's reporting on this, and, and there's people in the field saying, hey, you probably should look at this, uh, especially with the one in French Polynesia, because these people are traveling to Brazil, and you have the, you have the mosquito there. So there was kind of like an early warning there, but kind of just a, a mention, and now we have this emergency. So you know, this, that's two of the four. The other, the other two, uh, Ebola, same thing. Months went by before the emergency was declared and before everybody mobilized for that, and the other one is polio. Uh, in case you were wondering what the four were. <laughs> so how do we speed up the process? How do we speed up the process from when somebody raises a flag to when major public health authorities like the World Health Organization, CDC, et cetera, uh, decide to act on, on them? I, I think it's, it's a very difficult question in the sense that uh, uh, the declaration from WHO is not unilateral. It's part of the discussions. Uh, and the authorities uh, at the double show, they need to have consultations with the expert uh, consultation panels. And sometimes countries are opposing. And uh, the double show is not an international agency. It's, in, it's actually an intergovernmental agency. The owners of the uh, organization are the governments. And if they veto the declaration, then they cannot uh, uh, develop the declaration for uh, the uh, public health emergency of international concern. The process is that we need in public health to be more active, uh, and I think that's something that uh, they are expecting. And mobilizing the world for the response uh, uh, required a lot of uh, consensus. And uh, sometimes we need to uh, publish that there is some uh, potential correlation, but the actual mobilization of the globe for the response is not uh, easier. And has not been done for uh, other conditions. Uh, MERS never had, had uh, and is a very important problem. Great. Thank you. Um, does someone have a mic? Yeah, we're going to go real fast the last three questions. Go ahead. So, Ellie partly answered this, I think, already, but I wanted to ask the other two um, speakers also. Dr. Castillo mentioned trying to reduce the panic among pregnant women in Mexico, and I'm wondering what types of messages and what types of activities are being done there or elsewhere, specifically for pregnant women who are certainly panicking um, about this. Well, one thing that they are discussing in Brazil is to discuss with the media, because media is part of the problem with all this panic and bring in uh, if public figures that uh, the population are accepting them as leaders to send the messages. Uh, many times that they use uh, football, uh, but for pregnant women, they need to find a different. In the past, the president was a very good, but now it's so bad that even the, a message from the president will be worse. Then they, they need to understand how first the press should suppress so much confusion, and second, find figures that will send the message. Uh, in some countries, they use telenovelas, and the leaders of telenovelas has been very influential. Great, maybe if you both could give your questions one behind the other, and then we'll pick answers. Go ahead. Well, very briefly, my name is Soraya Fleischer. I'm a Brazilian anthropologist, and I'm starting to research Zika. And my th I have three little, s very short uh, points. One is, you mentioned uh, there was a, like a flyer of suggestions of what should be done, like screen and, sure. and there was something on the left that was vaccination against yellow fever. Mm -hmm. And I would like to understand how that has to do with the Zika, because I never heard of that. That's the first point. The second point is that we have been talking a lot about individual, uh, how do we change individual practices of cleaning our houses and cleaning our, you know, our our backyards and everything, but in Brazil, from my point of view in Brazil, we have a major government problem that is sanitation, that is you know as asphalt and taking care of the public space. So I think that, I mean, we have to think about the individual education part, but I mean, how can the researchers and the universities and you know the global institutions help the governments 
um, be responsible for their part. Because for, for the Brazilian government right now, it's great to talk about the individual behavior. It's great. This re let's responsible these stupid and you know, uh, unclean people. Right. That's the idea, and that's very dangerous. And the third thing is just a suggestion here for the Bloomberg Center is that maybe a third seminar could be the social determinants and Zika, because we have been talking about a lot about the biology part, and that's very important, but the biological part, but maybe we should, in the epidemiological part, but maybe the social determinants, and you know, that would be a suggestion, just a suggestion. Great, thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, uh, can you please explain why uh, in Brazil we have more cases, cases of uh, microcephaly than in Mexico? Uh, especially if you see uh, there's uh, maybe the prevalence in Brazil is like higher, or there's other causes as uh, right now, like they see it, it's, it's more in, uh, for people who had like a second, as a, like a second infection or third infection from the same family, flavivirus, as dengue. And if it's the latter one, uh, should we be really con consider it's like pandemic or epidemic in uh, cities or countries which they don't have uh, dengue or other viruses from the same family? Um, you know, just to just to respond to, to that that la last point at the at the seminar last week, they obviously there's a lot unknown, but the thought is that one issue is that Zika is first in Brazil, and we just don't know how it's going to play out in other places that the pregnancy is maybe ongoing. It's maybe a little too early to answer that. But maybe if, if there's something you want to say, and then certainly the yellow fever question. Yes, I, I will be answered. You already answered. We don't know. We, we, we need to continue some investigations. Regarding the yellow fever, actually, those are the packages. Countries, they don't want to do individual uh, diseases when they are linking yellow fever, they are uh, uh, putting dengue, they are putting chikungunya and Zika. And that's why they use that. This is uh, what's prepared not by Mexico, but the World Health Organization and PAHO. And that's why they want to maximize that those measures will have an impact over all the spectrums of conditions that are uh, uh, based on IDs. And that's why they put it. It's an opportunity to spread public health messages. And I would put a plug out there. The, thing, the similar thing we have not done for Zika, which we should be doing, is talking about pregnancy prevention, which is a huge problem in a lot of these places, but is very challenging, particularly in countries that have large uh, Catholic populations yeah. in particular that can make that. There, when, I, when I was in Columbia, they just had announced that it was acceptable to get an abortion in the case of Zika. Um, so, uh, and that was a big step for the country. Um, so uh, I think that the point that was made on social, de uh, social determinants is very important. There is an entire very important ethical and reproductive health angle to Zika. This is not going to be, I'm sure, the last uh, seminar uh, on, on Zika. But please join me in thanking uh, our panelists and uh, it was a really interesting discussion. We, for our guest, Dr. Brooks, we have a t-shirt here. Even uh, This is going to have to go on, on top of the UNC t-shirt in your class. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Yeah.